of you for joining us this evening. I would like to invite our um, one, Jaime de la Cruz, one of our supervisors, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ready, sir. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Is there a motion to acknowledge certificate of posting? Second, Madam Chair. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. We only have one item on at this uh, special meeting. It's a regular agenda item, and that is to discuss the medical marijuana cultivation, and I'm going to let our CAO introduce the item. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so administration, along with uh, Council staff um, looked at um, our past meetings and um, what your board had requested us to meet today, a uh, special meeting um, to discuss medical marijuana and the cultivation of it. So today, um, with that, we've, we've put down a scope of meeting. Um, we hope you can follow that the best you can. We're not, I'm not sure on timing, but uh, we have um, is to the first item is board determination of whether to proceed with standard public comment format or allow discussion in a roundtable format. So I think this is something that you might want to um, discuss. Okay. Um, and then uh, after that is to um, move forward with the overview of the current law as it applies with marijuana cultivation. Again, we have county council. We have uh, our assistant county council here as well to probably discuss some of these items uh, with your board. Um, and her name is Barbara Thompson. Um, so, and there's, and there's a few other items too. There's some questions that um, are outlined uh, for your board uh, to discuss. Should larger scale cultivation be allowed? Mm -hmm. um, uh, if so, should commercial cultivation be allowed in all zones or certain zones? Uh, should commercial cultivation be conducted only inside a fully enclosed structure? And so on. So there's quite a few questions here that we've outlined that, you know, if the board wishes to follow these uh, and to discuss these particular items, um, it, it's it's the wishes of the board so okay thank you so much and what I'd like to do is uh, my recommendation as the chair would be that we allow speakers three minutes as we always have this is a special board meeting and I'd like to conduct it as such and not as a workshop necessarily the workshops can be done outside of the boardroom maybe in other locations or at a different time and have more roundtable type discussions but we do want to give the public an opportunity to address the board on any of the issues and if you have a copy of the scope of the meeting you're welcome to present to the board any ideas any recommendations any suggestions and after those three minutes are up for each speaker then I would like for the board if that's acceptable that we have the opportunity to call back speakers if we have questions uh, that we would like to ask of them uh, if we need additional information that we then call them back uh, as the board wishes so if that's acceptable for the rest of the board, I think that that's the way I would like to conduct this meeting. Um, Mad Madam Chair? Yes. Um, um, can I put it this way? Um, I, I mean, my, my first concern, Madam Chair, is that we have a March 1st deadline on, because the state of California has, has, has given local, local communities a, dis, uh, a deadline to decide do we want to do a local control ordinance or do we follow the state of california ordinance that's that's my first question madam chair what direction do we want to go uh first of all i don't believe that that's uh correct i think we the the in uh based on what i have received from rcrc and csec san Benito county any county has a lot of leverage there will be state regulations but they will not um we still have the opportunity to to create our own ordinance our own zoning, our own, you know, however we wish to move forward with the ordinance. It doesn't have to follow state guidelines. Okay. All right. And then my, my next question, Madam Chair, is uh, three minutes is not going to be su suffice enough time to allow members of the public to, to discuss these issues because I, I believe that there's a lot of issues to be discussed in, in a, in a three-minute session. It, it's, it, it won't provide uh, enough time. And, and I see that there's an opportunity for us to go into a roundtable discussion if we decide to go in that direction. And if we are going to go in that direction, Madam Chair, then we, we the board, should direct have 
have uh, uh, time, time uh, have dates in set already, so they can start meeting and then inform the public to go in that in that direction, Madam Chair. Okay, so you're are you recommending then that we uh, move forward in a round table format, or or to adjourn this special board meeting as it is now, and to proceed as a committee well, committee meeting? Yes, I would. I mean, unfortunately, we have all four of us here. We probably would have had all five of us here. If if the wish of the board is to is to go into a regular board meeting session, special session, and then then go through the three meetings. But if and then at the same time, do a follow up of the committee to do roundtable discussions. Uh, I I don't feel, Madam Chair, today we're going to be able to draft any policies mm -hmm. and we that's not the expectation the that. expectation today if i'm if i understand it correctly is that it's to hear the public okay and to have input from them i don't believe that even in one evening we can okay. we can actually formulate any kind of ordinance for the future okay. but we certainly want to get information from the public okay. to get ideas to formulate an ordinance moving forward okay if, and that's the case i'm comfortable with that as long as uh, it allows the public to have a roundtable discussion in the with, the sub, with the committee. Okay. I, I don't know if, if, this, if this board is the idea setting or the committee that created it. I don't know which way is the best way to go about it. Mm -hmm. But at least we'll afford it that opportunity to the public. Okay. Uh, Supervisor Patel. Okay. For a point of clarification, Supervisor De La Cruz, uh, the committee, which I'm one of the members, uh, unfortunately, <coughs> uh, Supervisor Munzer is in Washington uh, on a very important issue. Both of us are committed to meeting with stakeholders and uh, on, on an individual basis and learning everything that we need to uh, have, have to make a good ordinance. And that's what uh, – that the final outcome has to be is taking into account the public input and their concerns um, also uh, developing an ordinance that is uh, reasonable and enforceable uh, and that's a take some time and uh, we're it's a very dynamic issue not only here in San Mario County but statewide I just came back from Sacramento this afternoon myself and uh, at, from an RCRC meeting, and we were discussing policies. And the me medical marijuana policy is this is just two pages of it at the RCRC. And if you could see all the way in the back, it's all red. We're developing policies even at the state le uh, county levels. And, um, you know, so it's not, a, we're not be able to come up with an ordinance tonight or come even close to that but what the committee w and staff is interested in is hearing the, the input from the public and I'm very very pleased of the turnout tonight and also from our colleagues on the board because we don't want to go through a lot of work and then then there's something that we overlooked as a committee um, so that's why uh, I'm very pleased that the staff was able to put together the scope of the meeting. Uh, hopefully, um, you know, we could get good information within the time lot. Uh, and if not, please um, give me a call. I'm very accessible um, on my cell phone. Staff, uh, usually, uh, if you don't have my phone number, certainly give the administration office a call and they'll give you my phone number and if anyone after the meeting uh, wants to uh, arrange a private uh, uh, conversation uh, please come up and uh, get my card so that's uh, that's the intention of our committee at this point in time so uh, supervisor Patello so then do you agree with the format that I am uh, wanting to yes to follow okay Supervisor yeah. Rebus. Um, and Madam Chair, I also uh, agree with the format. I think that this is certainly, you know, I'm not here, you know, um, I'm not prepared to make a decision on ordinance tonight, obviously, but this certainly is part of the process in helping us as a board in developing uh, um, uh, an ordinance that's going to work, you know, for local residents um, and uh, for our board uh, and certainly for our law enforcement agencies. As uh, my colleague said, you know, we want an ordinance. Um, that's going to make sense. It's going to be enforceable um, as well. Um, 
you know, and so and 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 I'm obviously looking to uh, um, the two supervisors on um, this committee to get their hands dirty. That this is one one step in the process to create, hopefully, a very good ordinance, um, because this is obviously uh, the two times that this item has been um, uh, on our agenda. Um, you know, I think what we can all agree is this is a very complicated. Uh, issue um, uh, and there's a lot of uncertainty when it comes to marijuana in California moving forward. So um, I want to I'm going to welcome everyone and thank everyone for being here. Okay. Thank you, thank you Supervisor Riva. Supervisor De La Cruz. Yes, thank you, and, and I concur with my fellow supervisors, and thank you uh, for that direction. Uh, I just you know just for the board, I I also attended the CSAC conference, and one of the sessions that I attended was the the marijuana, and, and there were a lot of counties that were talking to me that they're they're moving forward with implementing uh, marijuana ordinances as long as it's done right and it's done in the best interest of the community. And it, it and it, the one word that I that I heard over and over was a revolving policy that allows for changes and economic benefit for the community thank you madam chair okay thank you so um, so the public you know that you can speak to any of the um, items that are on the scope of the meeting but if you want to add something that isn't on there we welcome your comments so at this time I will go ahead and open it up to the public and I'll ask the clerk of the board to um, see if you have speaker cards. Madam Chair, we didn't have speaker cards at the beginning, but we handed them out. So anybody who has filled them out and uh, would like to uh, speak, you can bring them up. And okay. Uh, so I'll invite whoever wants to come up first, please. You're welcome to, to speak. And there are speaker cards, you said? Uh, there are speaker cards. We handed them out. Good evening. I'm Lana Blodgett, and I am president slash director for Monterey Bay Alternative Medicine. And it's located in Delray Oaks, and it serves your county as well. Um, and I'm here because I'm going to have a little bit of a different approach. I've come here today to thank you, to thank you for your leadership that you've provided for this community, to thank you for recognizing the impending transition to allow for medical and legal use of cannabis and weighing very carefully with the wisdom and compassion that all of you have. To thank you for this day of listening to those of us who have remained in the shadow of stigma and misunderstanding and have come forth to help you recognize and realize the truth. I'm also here to better your understanding by representing the 10,000 patients from Monterey, Santa Cruz, and San Benito counties that we serve. I am thanking you for Catherine, a lover of her community who at age 65 suffers from terminal cancer. Her immune deficient body could not withstand the toxicity of chemotherapy. So she came to us because she wanted to live. She heard from her doctor about recent studies that had shown promise in the terrible battle to fight this more than devastating disease. She came to us in her pursuit, and we recommended cannabis oil. Now, just after four months of this regimen, according to her doctor in the latest tests, has successfully reduced her cancer to just 25% of its original size. I'm thanking you for Blythe, a lovely, outgoing, loving 92-year-old with a strong penchant on how to live life. She suffers from glaucoma and almost completely lost her vision. In the course of treatment, she would have to take these long drives to Stanford University Medical Facility to receive very painful injections that try to curb the curse of losing her vision permanently. 
she had heard about how cannabis is beneficial to eliminating glaucoma. So she came to visit us with her beautiful, inquisitive nature and asked us many, many pertinent questions. And you may summarize, so please. Okay. I am so encouraged and delighted that you as representatives of San Benito County have not forgotten to consider the human element of kindness, the understanding, the awareness that not all methods of health options and choices should be mainstreamed into what others have said are safer, better options. We are all aware of the long lasting negative side effects and risks through the use of the regular pharmaceutical world. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, I was going to have us call back anybody, oh, but would back you rather before. that we ask them what, uh, allow them an opportunity or allow us an opportunity to ask them questions while they're still up there? It, it might be easier okay. that way, Madam Chair. Yeah, in this case way I don't need to remember everybody's name. Okay, <laughs> no, go ahead then. We'll, we'll go ahead and change the format that if we do have questions, we can ask you after you've spoken, or we can also call you back after uh, you've had an opportunity to speak. So, all right, okay. go ahead, Supervisor. You know, Patel. one of the things that we're wrestling with is, you know, for residential um, use, is just it, growing the uh, marijuana outside or inside, and and the conditions if it is outside. Because what we're trying to accomplish as well is, you know, the safety of the person having the product. Uh, where they're not subject to theft or vandalism or and so forth, but you know, also allowing that that right. person to have have that in Monterey County. You know, how how do they handle that? And and is there any conditions uh, to the individual uh, uh, patient that is growing it for their own personal use? I believe. Mr. Supervisor, that that question is still being significantly answered by Monterey County. I think that all of us have been kind of boxed into this corner of the state regulations coming on board and what do we do? And that is a very valid question to be considered because as many of us know, some of us make our own tea that is beneficial. Some of us make other products within our own home or take supplements or do things of that nature to benefit their health. It's very difficult to ascertain what the safety factors would be and how the regulation would take place on how to enforce that. It's a very tough question. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I was looking for an but easy I, answer. But I, but I do think that people have the right to do that, is yeah. what I'm saying. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Any other questions of no. Ms. Uh, Blatchett? Okay. No? And I would also like to take the time to invite all of you to come by and actually take a look at our dispensary. It is a model, and it is set up in a way that it's extremely regulated and very successful in helping our patients. Thank you very much. Okay. Good evening. Uh, my name is Robert Blodgett, and I'm one of the co-directors with Lana of the Monterey Bay Alternative Medicine. Uh, I also own a, a ranch in San Juan Batista. Uh, my family has owned this ranch for 30 years. And at this ranch, this is where we grow the medical marijuana uh, for our dispensary in Delray Oaks. And I'm hoping that we can uh, be helpful in giving you our inputs in what, what we do and what we think should happen. Uh, we grow inside and we grow outside. So we have a lot of knowledge, and you're welcome to come there at any time. Thank you. Uh, oh, I have ahead. a question yes, for this please. gentleman. So at this point in time, um, what type of regulations or uh, permitting ha do you do to be able to have an operation like this? Uh, do you apply with the state in, uh, public health or how, how do you do this? 
Well, grow uh, for the dispensary or for the, for the grow in San Benito County well, or both for both. Okay, uh, we started a, a basic collective uh, in San Benito County five years ago uh, with about a hundred members, and everything we grew there was divided amongst the hundred members. They were all patients. Uh, then the opportunity came to have this dispensary, and so the uh, collective that's in San Benito County is the same collective that, that does the dispensary. So it's okay. That's the way it works. So we have an, an LLC nonprofit um, with a dispensary, and this is an offshoot of it. It's part. Of, it's part of the same. Okay. Any other questions, Madam Chair? Yes, please. Um, there's revenue involved in, in the process, right? In the process of, of, of the dispensary, the dispensary the it's a nonprofit. The whole operation is a nonprofit. Okay. Uh, yeah, we have a but, nonprofit. But there's revenue uh, activity going on too, right? Yes, there is. And okay. costs. There are. Okay. All right. We, okay. As far as the overall, um, the overall uh, revenue is, so far we broke it. We've not broken even. We've lost a small amount of money. We're close to breaking even. Uh, do uh, I have a question? Do you have uh, a board? For yes, we do. Do you have an executive director? Yes. So the executive director does get paid? Uh, not not yet. Okay. And is that you? Uh, it's Lana, and I'm I'm next. But we haven't drawn salaries yet. We'd like to. <laughs> you know, uh, part of the uh, discussion today we had um, in Sacramento is that. You know, naturally, if we're set in regulations, that somehow we we'll have to pay for it through fees. Uh, that you know, the government oversight that it doesn't come cheap, and then also, uh, you know, Sacramento is talking about you know their involvement and they're talking. Uh, are you familiar with 1498 uh, Assembly Bill 1498? It's uh, being proposed by Assemblyman Wood, and if it's passed, they're talking about nine dollars and twenty-five cents per ounce for marijuana flowers, two seventy-five per ounce for marijuana leaves, and one twenty-five an ounce for immature plants. And that's just that. Uh, and I don't know what what this costs. You know, I have no idea about you know if that's a big portion of, but a concern is that as we add fees and taxes on, it still promotes the black market industry and it doesn't really help the commercial component either. Uh, do you have an opinion or an idea? On, well, on, from our perspective, uh, we're supplying patients. And as far as these fees that are come along, we would expect they would be passed along to the patients. And we, we provide uh, a very good, safe product uh, in a safe manner. Uh, I guess uh, if the medical marijuana was, for instance, twice the price of the underground, then you'd have a problem. Um, but that's not our concern. Uh, we do it the best we can, and we sh the patients, they like our service and they like our products. I'm sure that they would be, would be glad to to have a tax that wouldn't be too excessive, but they'd pay it. Yeah. Yeah. We have another question. Over. Are you done, uh, done, Supervisor? Go ahead, Supervisor Rivas. Yes. Um, so thank you for your comments. I may have missed this. I was reading some, some article um, about marijuana in California. So our previous ordinance, and the reason why we're here today is because there was some disagreement on our board as far as, you know, the regulation of uh, marijuana, of uh, the cultivation of marijuana. I think our previous ordinance said, our draft ordinance had said a limit of 12 plants. I believe so, yes. 12 plants. 12 plants. Um, and so, you know, and I oppose the ordinance because I myself am, 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 am uncertain moving forward because of the state regulations you know, the groundbreaking regulations that, that were passed by the state legislature um, and the impact it could potentially have on, you know, um, some commercial grows. So, f so, you know, as we are gathering all this research, in your opinion, what is appropriate, you know, for, 
for San Mateo County, in your opinion, what is, what is appropriate as far as from you know the cultivation standpoint of marijuana? You know, and we have a packet that talks about type one, type one A, type one B, all these different square footage um, of potential grows. So my question is, in what you know, in your opinion, what would what, what would be appropriate? You know, you know, it's uh, there has to be a, an end to all that production. There has to it has to go somewhere, and it has to go to somewhere in this state. Uh, those bigger grows, I suppose, would go to uh, manufacturers, to concentrate makers. Uh, ultimately, there's going to have to be uh, a limited amount of those. Uh, I don't know when you're talking about the whole state how who's going to figure that out. Uh, but there's only a, a certain amount of cannabis that's going to be used medically, and that's that's a limited amount. I, I think that uh, from our standpoint, we just need to produce what our patients need. Uh, so we're kind of a small uh, example, really. But I, I think that uh, everybody that produces medical marijuana, uh, especially in the future, uh, well, it's going to be tracked by the state. We're, we're going to know where it all, how much is there, and it's going to go somewhere, or I guess it'll be destroyed. That's all I can imagine. Mm -hmm. But it, what's so good about, I think, this new law is that uh, they'll be, uh, we'll know where it all is, and when we're going to know where it all goes. And so I see no problem with that. Uh, there may be overproduction, in which case then that'll probably stop, because it can't go anywhere. Uh, did, I, did I answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions for Mr. Blatchett? No, I have a question to Supervisor Botello. Um, Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay. Um, Go ahead. Madam Chair, uh, Supervisor Botello, you mentioned this uh, by uh, um, Hill pushing the uh, the $9.25 per ounce concept. Is that a s state revenue or is that a local revenue? That would be um, um, state revenue. So state revenue. And it's uh, the question that you're asking is where does that money go and why? Uh, and that was exactly what my question was uh, this morning. And uh, uh, the answer I received, it's, and I wrote it down right here, it's unclear at this time. Uh, what scares me about the state is that they're good at collecting revenue but are slow to return it back to the county. But uh, proceeds, um, it said it would be utilized to, uh, for environmental impacts, and I would imagine that would be clean up um, illegal type of operations and, uh, throughout the state. And, uh, but where the money is a go, there, there's, it's not spilled out in the bill. Yeah. And I think that's why RCRC is, at this point, is supporting it with amendments. Yeah, because uh, Madam Chair, was one of my concerns is that is that we're going to take the blunt. We, the local community, is going to take the blunt, and yet the state's going to get the money. You know, over and over, the state does that to us. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that whatever direction we go, if we're going to go into a direction that it has the potential to generate revenue for our community. And I, it, it's my understanding, and Supervisor Reva, I mean uh, Batello, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but. The state is going to set their own regulations, they're mm -hmm. going to collect their own licensing, their own taxes, and then the county has the ability to do the same thing above and beyond what the state is doing. They're going to give us that kind of leverage and flexibility that we can, we can tax it and govern it and license it as we please above and beyond what the state is doing. Is that's that right. your understanding? That, that's exactly correct. Okay. All right, go ahead. Uh, we have a speaker card yeah. for this gentleman. Okay. Hi. Hi. My name is Sean Donahoe, and, and I have spent about three, three of the last years up in Sacramento working on a lot of this um, legislative question. So I'm, I know Assemblymember Wood and Assemblymember Bonta, who's my personal assembly member, very well. So I live in Oakland, and I travel all over the state, it seems, lately, because um, there's quite a lot of implementation at the local level. So I do work as senior advisor for the California Growers Association, which is a trade association of, of cultivators, of packagers, of, of infused product manufacturers, of dispensaries, of delivery operations, you name it. It's very exciting. And before that, I, I was also um, the founding uh, partner um, for the California Cannabis Industry Association. 
I wasn't doing this three years ago. I was doing political campaigns, and that's really my background. And so I know quite a lot of people around the state, and so that's great that, that I'm able to sort of put those tools to good use to organize an industry that wants to be regulated, that wants to be represented, that wants to be part of the political process. And so what I've seen in the last three years is fantastic, a switchover in the state capitol from, from um, you know, not – particularly understanding or not wanting to understand the medical benefits of cannabinoid therapies. And I'm a patient. My mom's a patient. I know a lot of patients. Um, but but now in Sacramento, the, the, the dynamic, I think, has completely shifted. It's trying to figure out how to implement a system that works. And we, we, we want to incentivize a system that will work. Anything that, that doesn't um, encourage people to participate is going to fail. So now that politicians have their names on this, they want to make sure that their policies don't fail, that they don't fall on their face. So they're being very, very f um, not flexible so much as um, a, a reasonable basis of understanding for forming rules that, that will be sculpted to suit the unique particular um, uh, dynamics that California has. It's different than many of the other states that are adopting um, standards, different than the federal standard. So on the subject of AB 1549, I know it super well. Um, and there is a 40-40-20 split with, with the funds going towards different sort of um, uh, law enforcement, both local, if you choose to obviously allow cultivation into your area, as well as for environmental or local law enforcement grants, as well as for um, environmental restoration, as well as for the administering of, of a state water board project. That is, unfortunately, right now, it's not yet rolled out on the Central Coast for the Central Coast Regional Water District. It has rolled out in the, in the Central Valley and in the North Coast. Um, and so they are issuing uh, water discharge um, uh, waivers um, uh, in both those two regional water districts. And we do anticipate that it will be brought online as soon as the bill becomes law. Of course, AB 243 was a component of the MRSA bill package. And so this um, ultimately will require funding. And so that was Assemblymember Wood's intention to bring an excise tax. They did have a two-thirds urgency clause attached to all the, the, the bill package last August, but it got crazy near the end of session, and it got deleted. So it got restored this year, and it seems that, that much of this funding will absolutely be available for local law enforcement, environmental restoration. Can I? You could summarize. Okay. I mean, I could go on about the state legislation, everything great that I see. Well, if we have questions, why don't you stay there for a minute? Is there something you wanted to summarize before? Actually, I have a, Madam Chair, I have yeah, a sure. question of him. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, this, this, this fee structure, uh, thank you for explaining it. Sure. Um, if, the, if we were to implement an, an ordinance that, is, that governs and protects our community and, and provides for law enforcement protection, is, will there be a, a limit, a maximum? How, how would it affect if we decide to go in that direction in terms of increasing that $9.25? And there's going to be 218 scrutiny to ensure that the costs that are, that are taken do not, um, um, uh, cannot be construed as something other than a fee. So obviously there's that. Um, um, you know, obviously you're totally free to put something on the ballot as well. To, to as long as it goes to 218. Yes, sure. to, to apply a tax above and beyond. Um, I would say one point is, is not necessarily that the state gets to implement and take their cut, and then it's also the county that's, that's due to take their cut. I think I would put the cart before the horse. Remember, the whole implementation of this in the next two years of the MRSA is, is now the state has acted, and they've said the ball's in your court localities, because in two years' time when the state licenses will be available, the, you will get um, a, a state license contingent upon um, proving that you have a local operating permit. Okay. So, so in actuality, I'd say you are well situated to to advance and innovate and adopt an ordinance that fits community values. I, I serve on the city of Oakland's Cannabis Regulatory Commission, and we're doing the same sort of thing. We're adopting cultivation, manufacturing, testing labs, and, and overhauling our dispensary ordinance, just incidentally. Um, and now, uh, Madam Chair? Uh, yes, please. So the March 1st is not really a big issue because reading, it, reading the information and research, it seems like it, it's an issue. I mean, it's it's certainly been utilized to to and in my in my personal opinion to gin up some controversy to push for a ban in areas where people, for whatever contingent reasons, want want bans. But um, I stood on stage speaking in Las Vegas with the bill author Rob Bonta in front of a thousand people, and he very much said it was a mistake. It will be deleted. Um, Assemblymember um, Reggie Jones Sawyer down in LA agrees. Assemblymember Bonta uh, Wood also agrees. And it's my understanding that the um, legislative leadership also has affirmed that this is this is not a date that is in, was intentionally put in. And it's also being misconstrued. I've seen 
you got to regulate delivery by March 6. Otherwise, the state takes over complete control. Like, just bonkers misinformation is out there because it's very confusing. This is a very complicated um, um, regulatory framework that's being unfolded after 19 years of total, total vacuum at the state level in terms of uh, legislative leadership. So um, well, obviously, you know, we can't delete the March 1st deadline until legislative action and they're not in legislative session. I would say either legislatively when they get through sort of the first house um, and then they'll be able to delete it. But also remember they're hiring a chief um, of the Bureau of Medical Marijuana Regulation. So it's possible that, that just the chief of the new bureau can simply say, you know what, that March 1st doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to start tweaking around the edges of the, of the legislation to make it really, you know, both incentivize um, those currently unregulated to participate as well as just make it work. Yeah, and there's one thing that I also share with Supervisor Botello in his earlier remarks is that there's a, there's a federal law that says that we can't use money to, to, to regulate or to um, other things in, in reference to a medical marijuana process. So I want to make sure that if we're going to go forward with the policy that any money that's county, county expense, uh, and this is in reference to Supervisor Patel, that's being used, that it's being recovered, there's a, there's a reimbursement mechanism in place that allows the county not to incur dollars that we cannot use per federal regulations. I mean, I mean the federal government hasn't been particularly consistent, but our, our um, legislative body at, at the federal level has spoken consistently with, with the far Rohrabacher um, uh, language to dis disallow um, Department of Justice funds to be used to prosecute. And now obviously those are those that are in conflict with the Controlled Substances Act. But, um, you know, if you look at other administrative, um, uh, the policy of, of, of the Obama administration, uh, Deputy Attorney General James Cole repeatedly called for California to enact clear regulatory framework before we legalize for medical marijuana. We've done that now. So it would be seen that, that there's just an, a ton of overwhelming evidence from the federal level that we're, we're down the right track. And actually, when the bills were signed by Governor Brown, he implemented, he doesn't do this for every bills, but he did implement a signing statement where he said, I am going to sign this bill. And as I sign these bills, this indicates to the federal government that we are implementing real reform, not just on paper, but in practice. And I'm telling all the agencies, even though licenses don't come out in two years, to begin implementing implementation immediately and they've already begun working groups we we're in Santa Cruz speaking last week with a representative from the Department of Consumer Affairs and the Board of Equalization and it's moving um, and I believe that's exactly what the federal government wishes did that answer your question thank you madam chair okay supervisor Reeves, I mean but uh, yes you uh, well? yeah and the um, yeah 1548 oh. is the uh, state bank uh, is the what the 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 credit union the state yeah, bank the, no it's oh. vice versa okay 49 is the credit union oh, okay and 48 is the, uh, the other one up. and um and that's correct i just want to clarify to to the rest of the board that 35 percent of the the revenues minus the administration costs um you know from the state would be uh, used for the Department of Food and Ag for disbursement for local law enforcement re related activities pertaining to illegal marijuana cultivation. And the funds, they're allocated through an application process administered through the Department of Food and Agriculture on a competitive um, allocation. So we would be competing against everybody in the state for these funds. And in another 35 percent, so that's 75, uh, 70 percent mm -hmm. altogether that it would be going to natural, uh, uh, to the natural resources agencies to uh, fund competitive grant programs for environmental cleanup restoration. So a lot of this is uh, probably a be end, uh, end up in the Sierra uh, counties I, I would imagine uh, Humboldt and places like that but uh, I wouldn't count on the state giving us back you know the any, any uh, you know state funding state and so we're have to have our own fee structure to mm -hmm. administer mm -hmm. whatever sort of regulations that we have one of the things that I wanted to ask you before you step down um, you know and it is a big state with uh, the diversity uh you know from small counties to large counties to the agricultural counties to the sierra counties mm -hmm. uh is there any sort of development as far as uh template as far as standardized regulations at, at the local level 
Um, when we're studying this, uh, Supervisor Barrios and myself and, and, and law enforcement, uh, we kind of uh, looked at what other counties did sure. and are doing. Uh, and it's, it seemed to be pretty wide uh, dealing with different issues. Uh, is there anything that's yeah, no, I mean, I know folks from Humboldt to the north to National City down by the Mexican border that are working with organizations that I'm connected to that, that, that are, are figuring out how to best implement in the most streamlined nature the, the, the real core of local government authority is land use authority, how to, how to implement land use authority, then how to pay for that implementation of land use authority without getting into all the operational details of track and trace or operational details of laboratory testing and everything else so i mean yeah i've i've worked on model ordinances and helped help adapt them toward the towards if the you local could leave community your card with the clerk i'd appreciate even it even if it has a okay. a leaf on it <laughs> sorry <laughs> don't worry you, uh, <laughs> okay. this, um, this morning uh, our outgoing president he he passed out cups uh to all the rcrc directors and of course. Uh, it has a, a van on here and a picture of our <laughs> lobbyists or our Paul. legislative analysis yeah, yeah. driving Paul's high times. He was <laughs> <laughs> it's been fun since like I first met him about a year and a half ago when we met with, with the, the, the president, uh, the current president of, of CSAC. And um, we were talking about some of the other unique benefits um, within AB 243 that establishes appellations, zonal appellations, similar to, to um, viticultural regions. And, and um, the president of, of RCRC at that time is from Butte County. And he said, you mean we can brand Butte butter as, 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 a, as a, yeah, substance? And that was, that was unique. So, I mean, it's, it's going to be an interesting ride to figure out how to responsibly implement um, what the state has, has pushed push forward. And, um, yeah. Okay, I have just a couple of questions. You, you said you belong to the California Growers. Uh, is, it a, is that an association? Is it, what is that? It exactly? started out as the Emerald Growers Association, um, which predominantly is from up in the what's known as the Emerald Triangle, the, the historic um, uh, cultivation regions of, of Lake Sonoma, um, uh, Humboldt, and Mendocino. But then after the legislative session ended, um, we changed our name to the California Growers Association, and we have membership types for all of the license types envisioned in the MRSA. So you can be a Type 10 dispensary, you're a dispensary member. You can be a type four nursery cultivator. You're a type four nursery cultivator member of the trade association. And now, were you doing this for just medical uh, marijuana, medical medical? That's cannabis? the only legal thing in I California. Know, Absolutely. I'm, asking, yeah, I'm yeah. asking you that because yeah. there seems to be so much, you know, of it growing that sure. exceeds what is needed for medical purposes, from what I understand from RCRC. Uh, but so in, are you gearing up then for the legalization of re for the rec recreational use? Ab absolutely. So, I mean, just real quickly, like in my experience, I, I absolutely have run into shady characters, although we're talking about medical marijuana. It's the same plant. It doesn't know the difference between medical marijuana and marijuana. It's the human that actually does the cultivation and does the distribution that imbues it with a different sort of legal character and responsibilities attached to that, to the community and to the state and to following the law. Um, those folks that are not really interested in complying um, um, with, with Prop 215 and other sort of guidelines, they don't really seek out representation from people like me. They're not interested in getting engaged, so I don't represent them. They don't seek me out. I don't certainly don't seek them out. So, so I guess my that. question would be then sure. that you so, know, obviously you're doing this for medical, you know, but you sure. are, uh, as, as the, the state regulations sure. change and it becomes recreational, you will now do both. You will be... Yeah. Um, man, cultivating for both uh, for both purposes. Yeah, I mean that is that is that is the yeah, arc. The I mean, this goal. is a social justice and criminal justice issue. The war on drugs is probably not a good public policy. I think the majority of Americans now believe that. But um, no, I mean that's polls okay. show that. But um, yeah, no, absolutely. The ballot measure next year. There's um, 335 days. Who's counting? Um, and and I, it's strongly anticipated that voters in the states of 
Arizona, Nevada, California, Maine, M- Missouri, um, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Michigan will all um, uh, vote to legalize, and Florida and Arkansas will go medical, and and it's pretty much end game. Um, Uruguay, Canada, Israel, um, uh, Jamaica can all sh- you know set up infrastructure to ship internationally, and we're still trying to figure things out at the local level, despite the fact that we grow the, the world's best cannabis. Thank um, you so much. I would like to invite the next speaker. Thank you. Yeah, uh, please. You, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> one more question uh, from somebody else, if you don't mind going back up. I have one question, and I'm sure it's a foolish question, but hopefully you could educate me. No such thing. So as we prepare this ordinance, yeah. I'm caught between, um, you know, the cultivation of marijuana indoor or outdoor. Sure. I tend to think indoor obviously is best, but what are the difference between the two? Uh, for each pound of cannabis that's cultivated, there's the equivalent of um, consuming 200 pounds of coal in terms of CO2 emissions. Um, there is also the, the um, um, less effective um, uh, cultivation technique due to um, absorbing um, less than the full um, uh, spectrum of, of, of available light. So you do not have the full deployment of, of cannabinoids that can be developed and terpenoids that can be developed. So you're growing, it may be a more exciting looking product and from certainly from a recreational market that's called bag appeal. You know, it may look nice if it's tighter and because they use CO2 and all kinds of other indoor techniques. Um, it's cleaner maybe, but um, a very um, uh, a skilled um, sun-grown cultivator, particularly using light deprivation, advanced greenhouse technologies, can grow an absolutely equivalent product with superior cannabinoid potential at a, a, a huge cost um, um, savings, awesome. as well as obviously not, not putting carbon into the atmosphere. So, I mean, they're already running out the grid in Denver, and approximately 1% of, of our nationwide um, electricity is due to indoor lamp-grown cultivation. So it's not a good idea. So in oh, Denver, uh, I'm sorry. No, um, no, please, you still have the floor. In Denver, I'm not, you know, I'm, I don't know the specifics of their law. Do they allow both indoor and outdoor? Is it mainly indoor? In Denver, it's just indoor. It's, it's, just it's indoor. a very okay. factory-based, but in southern Colorado and Pueblo County particularly, well, Many, um, so my California Cannabis Industry Association was a state affiliate of a national cannabis industry association, so I know people from all over. And, and even in Colorado, many of them are shifting over to hybrid greenhouses, whereby they have, they have tilt up um, concrete walls sure. with, with a greenhouse lid. Um, but many of them are also just growing conventionally outside for cost savings alone, particularly if, if, if aesthetics is not appealing because what you're ultimately doing is, is, is doing an extraction process and making an infused product. Um, it doesn't matter how it looks. It's, it's actually getting the best cannabinoid benefit, so therefore outdoor is actually the best. Okay. And Supervisor Dela Cruz, you have a question? Yeah, actually a two-part question. The first part question is, what's more environmentally sound, indoor or outdoor? Outdoor, no question. Outdoor, no question. No question. And then, and then, Not from a good. smell perspective, if you do it outdoor, I mean, this should be on ag land. It should be on ag land of sufficiently zoned par- um, su- uh, you know, accu- appropriately zoned parcels of sufficient size with sufficient setbacks. So, you know, I drive by garlic processing plants, and there's smell issues. I mean, I used to live near a Wrigley chewing gum factory. I mean, there's smell issues in all kinds of food, food manufacturing and other products, uh, agricultural products meant for human consumption. But if it's being grown on an appropriate parcel with, with respect for, um, you know, land use considerations and your neighbors, I don't think aroma really should enter into it. Thank you, okay. Madam Chair. Thank sure. you so much. Next speaker. Jeffrey Lind. Hello, my name is Jeffrey Lind. I am from the Coastal Growers Association, which um, is the local, I guess, trade association for, uh, it's based kind of in Monterey County, but it's been expanding into San Benito County as well. Um, In that capacity, I know several responsible business operators. Um, These are professional individuals. They are transparent and they want to be honest. They're forthright. They want to ultimately benefit your community, whether that be through taxation with the financial benefit or offering additional jobs. Um, We know that bringing people in to work, they'll spend their money here. That's always a benefit for a community. Um, Ultimately, they want to bring in a professional industry here. Um, You know, there was a discussion about whether there's kind of a standard going on. I can tell you Monterey County is looking towards 
doing an ordinance, uh, the Coastal Growers Association would be more than happy to try and help uh, create a relationship there. I'm sure you have a relationship yourself with Monterey County, but you know, on the issue, we're more than happy to be involved you know, as needed with that. Um, there were some specific questions as to the scope of the uh, meeting that I kind of wanted to just address. Uh, one of them was dealing with large-scale cultivation. Um, I would encourage you to consider it as a large-scale cultivation site might have the ability to afford more overhead for things like security. Um, you know, with commercial cultivation, that's and where should it be zoned? That's something that I think you have a number of resources um, in terms of coastal, in terms of uh, local operators who are more than willing to meet with you at a roundtable discussion. Um, you can look towards ordinances that are being passed in other areas. There's really um, a number of options there and resources. So thank you for taking that opportunity and really looking at these issues. Um, in terms of what amount of plants should be cultivated per parcel, um, I would encourage you to look at canopy size and not plants themselves. That way you're consistent with the state regulation on the issue. Um, I think that would make it a little bit easier um, for operators and also potentially a little bit easier for the county in terms of definitions and the process itself. Um, most of these other issues that are on the scope of the meeting, I think you can find that you have a responsible, professional, and mature cannabis community and industry that is hoping to answer those questions for you. Um, some of them are here tonight and some of them would love to be here tonight but just couldn't make it. Um, so I would encourage you any opportunities we can to uh, allow them to come in and discuss how you should best implement this. I think it's great that you're considering it and um, open for any questions. Are there any questions? Yeah, Madam Chair. Supervisor Delacruz. <clears throat> yes. Um, does jurisdictions that have policies in place or moving forward with, with, with the policies, is, is there like a, a maximum amount of permits that they offer or is it like a lottery or first come first serve or depending on who's ready and able shovel ready ideas or I just don't know how to, how to ask the right question but yeah um, as to I think the question goes towards how do you deal with the amount of businesses coming in or, or should there be a cap or something of that nature I think you can see that there's plenty of examples of that um, I believe under the state law and don't quote me but I believe under the state law there are certain licenses that are capped um, there's several that are not um, but that is something that you can certainly look at as to how best to um, not overwhelm your resources. Certainly the cannabis community is more than willing to help fund whatever it needs to be in whatever way they're willing to you know, go about, I think, paying fees in order to make sure that the administrative portion of it can be done. But if there needs to be a cap so that you can reasonably and um, holistically look through each of the, you know, sites that you have, however many that may be, I think that, that there is support for that. So um, to answer your question, I think that there's options there for how you would do about do that. I don't think there's any one option that's the best. I think that uh, it's a decision that needs to be made between uh, this county uh, board of supervisors and the community. I think that's what's going to result in the best solution for this county. All right. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Um, not right now. I'd probably be you know circling back with some of these speakers anyway can you just tell me what you consider to be the cannabis community um i think that there are a uh, that's a great question one i think that there are a number of operators who are professional who look to the law who go towards government and ask what regulations can we put in place to make sure that we are doing a legitimate job of serving the community um, I think there are qualified patients who are finding medical benefits and they have, you know, they're able to go through that process. I also think there, you know, there is an entire industry from cultivation to uh, manufacturing to distribution networks, whether that be through a mobile or a fixed dispensary. Um, those all kind of come together and create, I think, a community, um, a community that is doing a lot of work to try and help sick people and I think that's important work that needs to be done Thank you. actually madam chair yes sorry about that uh, are you preparing for the next wave if if the voters do approve recreational uh, marijuana uh, that's an interesting question I think recreational is a bit of a separate issue um, 
One, it remains to be seen. We did have Prop 19, which proposed a very similar um, setup, but that was not successful. Um, it seems like it's somewhat inevitable in certain circles. Um, that seems to be the, the sway on it. But I think that there is still a legitimate medical benefit that needs to be preserved and needs to be looked at carefully. Um, and I think most of your operators are looking towards doing that, um, benefiting patients. Um, certainly there are some people who will probably be looking for recreational, um, you know, but there's a number of people who are looking at purely doing medical and purely working with patients. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Sure. Supervisor Battelli, you had a question. Yes, um, yeah, I do have a question. Um, I, I know quite a few of the people that have come up before us just, you know, during the period we've had with the speakers are advocating for uh, legalizing um, you know, larger scale cultivation. One of the, uh, I'll, I'll lay my cards on the table here and maybe you can answer this. You know, we're a small county. We have very little revenue from this, you know, you know, from property taxes uh, compared to other counties in the state. Thus, our service level is not what we'd all like it to see, uh, be at. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think currently we probably have three deputies on duty countywide and we were talking about an ordinance that um, it really is just for the unincorporated area we're not talking about the, within the city limits of the uh, uh, two cities that we have um, and the commercial component you know I think if we went in that direction it, it, it absolutely does need to be limited and and very specific uh, just because we have limited law enforcement abilities in this county to, you know, uh, provide protection for those type of operations as well as uh, the neighboring uh, businesses and, and residences. And, and, and that's, that's an area that uh, I, I think we, ought, we have to be, you know, very clear about is that, uh, you know, our law enforcement levels we're improving them you know i hope we add more deputies and i think we will uh, over a period of time but it's still for this type of i think it's pretty high risk compar uh, especially with some of the crime element that has been historically associated with you know marijuana and other drug activities uh, certainly. So uh, I'm going to try and speak to that issue. Um, I think that you'll find that most of those people who wish to operate or cultivate in this county um, would like to actually have a very close working relationship with law enforcement. Um, they would like the opportunity to know law enforcement, to have law enforcement feel comfortable around their operations. And they would also like to provide their own private security. Um, no business, whether it be a bank or a pharmacy or a cannabis cultivation site, is going to be benefited by a security threat. Um, and really, it serves those same, uh, you know, a pharmacy has those same concerns. There's things there that people would love to have um, access to. Same with a the bank, there's money there. So I think you have those same concerns with banks and with pharmacies. The cannabis uh, operators that I think you'll see would like to have private security you know that they're able to afford that's why i would suggest or encourage the board of supervisors to look at allowing larger scale cultivation so they can more fully um, expand their security options with more product going out there's more likely that they're going to be able to afford more overhead in that way um, i think if you also look at the community itself and the people who want to grow here they're looking for regulations and so i agree with you it does need to have regulations there does and to an extent, you know, the Board of Supervisors is more than welcome to put security regulations in place so that you're not overburdening your um, sheriff's office. I think that's a great idea. Um, you know, and for what it's worth, if there are, if there is some sort of tax benefit, I know that's a discussion that is ongoing. Um, the more products that go out, I would assume you would get more tax benefit from those products. So that's why I would consider a larger operation potentially more manageable as well. And I apologize, I do have no. to leave. So if there are any other questions, I no. have something that I have to go to. No, okay. no Madam Chair, no, I'm, uh, I don't have no questions, but okay. co more You're comments. To, to sure. go. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. I'll, I'll stay for your comment, though. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, my, my comment more to Supervisor Patel's position is that 
if we're going to move forward with an ordinance, I, I want to make sure that, that law enforcement gets a lot of funding. That's very important. Okay. Thank you. Um, clerk of the board, any other speaker cards? We don't have any speaker cards on hand. But, but if anybody has one to come up, please, uh, I welcome you to come out and address the board regarding this issue. Thank you. Ian Stiles. Ian what? Ian Stiles. Hi, I'm Ian Stiles. And uh, this is awesome. This whole process is really cool. Seeing the new face of cannabis and going town to town and seeing how professional it's becoming and how much more open-minded people are becoming. I'm passionate about the plant in general. I don't have my uh, act anywhere near as much together as the guys from the CDC and CGA. They're really professional and we're super happy to have them. Um, the issue of smell and the issue of security and, and law enforcement comes up a lot. And it's something that, uh, it's, it's a valid concern. But what I'm more concerned about is clandestine grows being done by illegal organizations that are blasting Eagle 20 and, and dangerous chemicals all over the road. And on the way into town, I actually noticed a huge amount of a dangerous fungicide being sprayed on the road. I don't want to breathe that in. My, uh, my partner and I rented a house in Napa um, and they were going to treat their fields with that while we were there as a rental vacation property. We said, please don't. We don't want to breathe that stuff in. That's a dangerous chemical. Well, that was being sprayed all over the fields when we came in today. My point is not that, um, that there isn't a place in time for all these different things. I really didn't have my thoughts together as much as I wanted to point out that, that as we worry about odor, you know, people say, oh, I'm worried about the smell of this. I personally think cannabis smells amazing um, and just is a wonderful, a wonderful plant and flower. Um, most of the people I've run into that are, are, are afraid of smelling it um, have either never smelled it or have an idea that it can make you seriously ill. And one thing that can make you seriously ill is the chemicals that were literally covering my windshield as I came into town. And that's, it's, you know, so we know so much more. I mean, we don't know so much more than we do know. Even our cannabis experts still have a lot to learn, um, you know, and a, and a lot to find out as, as our medical experts do. But we are finding out is that this is a plant and a medicine that's greatly, uh, uh, greatly beneficial to communities, medical patients, industry. Uh, and it reminds me of, of an episode of, I think it was Bonanza an old western and it was about a, a railroad coming to town and a lot of people were arguing over the price of timber and I think the Cartwrights had the majority of the timber and they were talking about the direction of the train coming through town and they argued so much about whether the train was a good thing or the prices of the timber were fair that the railroad just ended up in another town and that shows no longer on and that town doesn't exist <laughs> you know so um i'm super excited i'm just happy to be here honestly and like and to hear people's passions and want to take a moment to say there, there's there's really uh it's important that we're doing this but let's let's not be afraid you know because there's eagle 20 right outside now you know there's so not everything is faced not not everything is exactly what it what it seems to be you know or, or appears to be so any questions of this gentleman? I have a question. Where are you local? Are you from Hollister? I live in Santa Cruz, as a matter of fact. I came out here just like like other cannabis representatives to be part of this process and and to take place and to and to watch and just you know and to feel good seeing this process happen and be super thankful for it. Really. You and I have different smells, I'm sure, because to yeah. me, <laughs> it smells like skunk spray. So and you know there are strains there are strains of marijuana that do smell specifically skunky. Oh, there's there, there's a lot of them that smell like mango, and strawberry as well. I've yet to smell that one. So. Well, go get your medical card. I can probably point you to a few people that would be more than happy to uh, introduce you to those strains. I, if I had a hangnail, I'd go get them. <laughs> a hangnail? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, next speaker. I'm sorry. Any other questions? No, thank you. No worries. Thank you. Thank Glad you. I could give everybody a smile. <laughs> it's always good to laugh. Okay. Next speaker, please. Sharon Bush? Yes. Sharon Bush. Hi. 
<clears throat> I'd like to be another face of the dispensaries that may or may not be allowed to come into the area. Um, but more importantly, I just wanted to say that um, I am a, a medical patient for my arthritis. I was diagnosed when I was 21. Uh, something that I just recently discovered because of my son who had a severe skiing accident last year and absolutely crushed his arm. Um, he has in his elbow. He had to have his elbow rebuilt. They put him on <clears throat> opioids for the pain and uh, he has since over the course of the last several months he's weaned himself off from the opioids using medical marijuana. Um, he's, he could not sleep, he could not function without the opioids and now he's, he's weaned himself off, to, off all the opioids and the pain medications by using medical marijuana. My husband is also a patient. He has, he's a diabetic. He has, uh, he can't feel his feet, he can't feel his fingers, except for the stabbing pain that you hear about going through his feet. Um, the only way he can sleep at night is to do, to take a little bit of, of the medical marijuana and then he can go to sleep. The, the pain, the stabbing pain stops. Um, I, myself, personally, um, have the CBDs, which is strictly a pain medication in the, in the cabinoids with no THC. There's no hallucinogenics or whatever you want to call it from the, cannab from the cannabis side. Um, it allows me to go to sleep. It allows my pain to subside. Um, I just think it's a, it's a great benefit to so, to so many people. Uh, there's been children who have had the uh, seizures that are on the CBDs that I take. Um, there are no hallucinogenics or, or side effects to the CBDs. They just stop going from multiple seizures in a month down to none. Um, it's just amazing what's happening. I've come to the point where through this that I've, I would really love to be able to open a dispensary and help some of these people, um, even though I'm 60 years old. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's a great thing. So I just, I would love to see this happen around in, in San Juan, uh, the, the San Benito and Hollister. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any questions? I have a question. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. a believer of medical marijuana, and you know, I know we're, we laugh about you know some of these things, but I know that it is very beneficial. And so I don't, I don't think any of us up mm -hmm. here argue that. Uh, I think primarily it's the cultivation, you know, issues that we have to deal with mm -hmm. that are difficult. Um, uh, do you believe that you're local? You said yes. you're from Hollister. Yes. Is um, having a, a dis cultivation? Would you? Would you cultivate your own uh, and grow your own? I don't uh, think I know enough about it personally to be able to cultivate it. I think it's it. it there is a definitely a technique behind it, but I do believe that yes, I would I would want to have my own supply or my husband's supply, whatever that that would be helpful. But I think if it, what I would more point to is um, someone who knew what they were doing as far as the, the potencies and the, the purities uh, to, to be able to have it tested and know what's being done. Thank you. Anybody else? Any other no, questions? Thank okay. You, thank you for your comments. Anyone else from the public? Please come up. Crusoe. Ryan Grosso. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you for your time. Thanks for putting this forum together for us. Um, I founded a dispensary in Santa Cruz in 2012. I founded a manufacturing company where we make infused products and concentrates in Santa Cruz in 2012. We've been operating uh, legally under the guidelines of the Attorney General since then. Uh, I've got 20 years of cultivation experience behind me and uh, about 10 years of commercial cultivation experience. 
uh, it's a big topic to try to tackle and I'm really grateful that you guys are taking the time to hear us I imagine you have a lot of questions I have some answers I have some experience and uh, I think the woman was very very right when she said it's important to leave commercial cultivation in the hands of the people that have the experience and know what they're doing um, business professionals that have taken the time to learn the, uh, the techniques the business practices the laws everything that it takes to run a professional business and uh, that's what I've tried to do it's not easy I haven't made a ton of money doing this I've watched people around me on the black market make millions of dollars you know but we pay taxes um, we put our time in we make sure that we're doing things right and that's why we're here tonight I think in Santa Cruz since they instituted their county tax code for cannabis in November last year we've paid almost a quarter million dollars in taxes into their fund and you've seen a great benefit in the community with that uh, that's just our dispensary I think the whole 14 um, legitimate dispensaries in Santa Cruz have uh, produced close to a million dollars in six months so we far exceeded their revenue expectations just with their tax um, moving forward into cultivation uh, obviously I don't think sales tax is going to be the model for a wholesale distribution but the permitting fees that are associated to each of the license types uh, is probably going to be your best consistent model uh, it's probably going to have to be based on some kind of a square footage model so you've got the what 10 12 different license types everything down from a small kind of hobby garden all the way up through full-scale outdoor cultivation so my recommendation would be that you find something that's uh, reasonable that could be annually renewed so you'd have some consistent annual revenue um, you're going to allow guys to do commercial cultivation and you're still going to allow the compassionate act to work for the people that want to grow their own medicine the people growing their own medicine probably don't need a lot 12 plants might work the guys that are trying to pr provide for the whole state of California are going to need acres of crops and most likely you're going to see people trying to do that in greenhouses uh, just like other commercial agriculture industry uh, in supervisor Patello yeah I, I um, I'm curious as far as uh, the uh, the permitting that you're subject to in Santa Cruz County the cost what departments uh, come out to your facility um, how often is it just annual or do they come and visit on a quarterly basis how they monitor you know this you know sure. the sales activity and so, so I don't do the accounting so I don't know off the top of my head who exactly we pay but there is a a county level agency that we do pay our taxes to it's a seven percent tax on retail sales and they do an audit um, they've only had this ordinance in place since November of last year so about a year um, and so it's not a permitted fee that we have to pay to get a license we operate under limited immunity currently and so basically if we meet certain set of qualifications sellers permit um, chain of custody you know that we're paying our taxes and that we adhere to all the basic laws of uh, prop 215 then you're allowed to do your business there is a new ordinance in place it's a placeholder ordinance that uh, is meant to um, be changed in the future as it develops so um, the uh, the tax that is that you're subject to is just a the standard sales tax through retail yeah so we do the sales tax the 8.25 percent and then an additional cannabis business tax of they, seven percent of seven oh, percent uh, uh, on top okay that's where i was yeah, going yeah so, so the, the voters tax. did um through the 218 process vote that in uh no it's my understanding that that was uh put on by the county supervisors hmm. we got to look into that council is going to they did. Uh, look into that it depends. <laughs> uh, we need to bring the um, um yeah. address the board not yes the yes ma'am thank, thank you uh but uh council is going to give us yeah. some information so it depends on on you know some fees are really taxes disguised as fees some taxes are really fees disguised as taxes so um, if 
if the board is going to impose a tax, no matter what you call it, um, that has to be approved by the voters. On the other hand, if there is a fee, a regulatory fee, similar to like our code inspection fees, that are tied, the nexus is tied to the services that are being rendered. In other words, the county puts out $1,000 a year in regulating the industry and the fees that we're charging are $1,000 a year. Okay. Then that's not a tax and not subject to Prop 218. So we haven't really got into that level. Of, we really haven't had that discussion yet. And, or well, we have, we've had it, but I don't think a decision has been made which way the county wants to go on it. Yeah, I um, remember the discussion and, and that's, that's part of our problem is that there's a misconception, I think, with the general public that this could be a money maker for for the county. And I think uh, in best case scenario is that we could just break even in providing the, you know, the, the oversight and the service um, going out to uh, um, a tax. You know, it was kind of funny. Another county mentioned, because it was discussed today, uh, that it could be uh, a, a go to through the 218 process it's not that simple pass a tax in fact we weren't the only ones that failed on a uh, on a tot tax another county uh, couldn't pass a tot tax either and um you know so it would be you know a fee <coughs> structure that would provide the oversight and the permitting costs which i think all businesses should be subject to sure um you know, regardless of whether it's marijuana or any other type of business that, you know, the county provides services for. But I, I was curious as far as what, what you're, you know, have to go through in, in Santa Cruz. Well, it's still fairly unregulated. And um, I think he was correct that it was a voter passed initiative or, you know, tax, which was part of the ordinance. Um, however, when you look at bringing commercial cultivation in, um, most of what we're seeing, at least from my understanding, around the Central Coast is uh, permitting structure per license. And um, when you start to think about the amount of people that would apply for these licenses, with all the amount of agricultural space that you have in the area, um, it could generate significant revenue. And I think you would find a lot of us willing to pay a reasonable tax that's competitive with the neighboring counties. You know, I think it was estimated, I was at the conference in Santa Cruz last week, that there's uh, currently over 55,000 uh, marijuana cultivators in California. And if you divide that out a bunch amongst the counties, you know that there's thousands here in San Benito. And if you had the opportunity to, you know, you know, gain some kind of a permitting fee from all of the legitimate ones, that would, I think, uh, empower you guys to have more revenue to enforce the code with non-compliant people. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Good. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else uh, from the public have a speaker card or would like to address the board? Thank you, board, for the opportunity to address you regarding this issue. Um, my name is John Kolodinsky. I've been involved in the cannabis industry for a little over 10 years, um, uh, involved in uh, all aspects in uh, Santa Cruz from the retail side, uh, cultivation and manufacturing. Um, and we've worked with collectives throughout the entire state uh, throughout that time. Um, I think uh, it's really important to um, echo uh, your desire to maintain local control throughout this process um, and, uh, and, and I know that it's a complicated issue um, you know there is a uh, you know limitations to the economic benefit but I think you're right in understanding that at the very least it's going to be a net zero and if you structure it properly there's the potential for revenue um, and not only to be able to increase uh, you know the, the number of sheriff's deputies that are providing uh, safety to the neighborhoods in San Benito County um, but also for other services like drug prevention um, and uh, in youth services to um, you know benefit the community on a greater level um, you know some of the key components that I've 
heard people discuss throughout uh, the various meetings through California that I've been attending, um, you know, are protecting a youth, uh, protecting against diversion, um, you know, creating an enforceable law that will work within the community and that is clear for law enforcement. Um, I think it's important to, to come up with something that's not going to clog your legal system with, uh, with confusion. Um, and, you know, it is possible to create a policy that will, will do that. Um, you know, I think that I uh, just echo what some of the other speakers have said. You know, the majority of the legal industry is eager to work with law enforcement and eager to work with you as a municipality to ensure that we are compliant um, and that we're able to be respectable producers in your region, uh, taking good environmental care um, and responsibility in our cultivation practices. Um, I think, uh, you know, in looking at the license structure uh, that AB 266 has created, I think uh, it would behoove you to establish your structure that is in line with what the state has put out, um, and that will make the application process and the enforcement very clear as we move forward. Uh, there's been discussions about um, the legalization efforts that are, uh, you know, potentially pending in the future. Um, and. Uh, I was just reading something yesterday. One of the bills dropped, and all of those people that were putting them together are now supporting the other one, and that uh, the recreational side is going to be in line with AB 266 and that structure. So I think it would be good as you're laying the foundation of this building that you're creating, you know, metaphorically speaking, to do it in a way that is in line with the, the state um, to create a very uh, straightforward path in the future. Um, you know, creating this industry, uh, cultivation is most important because without it there would be no cannabis industry, but there is another, many aspects to the industry uh, with regards to extraction and manufacturing um, and incorporating all of those within your ordinance are going to be very important. If you could um, summarize, please. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, just to talk about the new era, Palm Desert, uh, you know, they've recently permitted three facilities uh, or three groups to operate on multiple facilities, totaling 380,000 square feet of canopy space. And those uh, fees associated with those applicants are in excess of $5 million that's going to go to renovating uh, that particular region. Um, you know, growing on ag land, uh, doing this work uh, in the right place is very important to mitigate against concerns with smell and other environmental factors and neighborhood concerns. I think that uh, staying far clear away of a lottery system is going to be in your best interest. A lottery gives you no control over who actually gets the license and whether or not they're a respectable member of the community or purely there to, you know, rape the benefit um, from the county. Um, and, uh, you know, create a license structure with a renewal mechanism, um, maybe a point structure that gives very clear uh, goals and um, parameters under which an applicant must qualify and it, it makes it very straightforward with the licensing body as to who does and does not qualify. Um, and, uh, you know, I think staying far clear away from a plant count uh, is definitely going to be the way to go. Canopies uh, size and allocations are, seem to be uh, pretty consistent throughout the state. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. Thank you very much for your time. Any questions of this gentleman? Yeah, I, I have one. Uh, some of those ideas are very interesting, and um, you know, I'm going to do some more research on on that um, and a follow up. But um, and to get more detail. But the question I have is: Is there any sort of uh, mechanism for legal operations pr that are permitted through you know you know local agencies such as Samuel County or any other county uh, monitoring each plant? You know, through some sort of it sounds wild, but a sensor type of system. Uh, is, is that being done? Um, so not so far in California. I think that you, you talk about the track and trace program. That's a that was track mentioned. and trace. Um, you know, we look at the, the, uh, the issues that came with the seed to sale, which is different than track and trace. If you talk about a seed to sale, you're dealing with the individual plant um, and the, the labor associated with monitoring an individual plant throughout the harvest. You don't when you're growing a canopy, you, you're, you harvest the canopy. You know, when you're growing strawberries, you harvest the field. You don't, you know, pick your berry and weigh your berry and quantify your berry and then put that berry in a box with other berries. Um, so uh, doing a, a batch tracking, I think, is going to be far better. The, uh, very cumbersome to do an individual plant-based um, tracking system uh, okay. on, on the operator as well as the, uh, the oversight committee who's going to be in charge of that. 
Okay, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Any other questions? Good questions. Okay, thank you so much. Anyone else? Should I introduce myself? Okay, okay. thank you. <laughs> I know. Um, good evening, everyone. Christina Chavez Wyatt. Um, I am a county resident. I'm a micro business owner. I'm a mom and I'm a wife of a farmer. I'm proud to be here and I thank you for your interest in learning more about how to defend our county from illegal growing operations and drug dealers, protecting our agricultural workers, residents, and public safety from the negative impacts of illegal activity, and keeping drugs and alcohol out of the hands of our youth. It's also important to protect our waterways, our open spaces, and farmlands from Ill illegal growing activity because that's what makes our community special. I do encourage you, as other speakers have said, to continue working with a diverse array of community stakeholders to jointly develop and approve an ordinance by March 1st if we're able to, learning from Monterey County, King City, Greenfield, Salinas, San Jose, Santa Cruz, to maintain maximum local control allowing for limited, permitted, and highly regulated residential and commercial cultivation of cannabis with support of proper zoning and permitting. On the commercial side, consider addition of limited dispensaries, manufacturing, and delivery of medical marijuana products and research in cooperation with local education institutions within the county for, and for export outside of our county. And also, please consider the high level of professionalism from growers, operators, and business owners here locally, with giving them a priority with their local employees for a first chance if we're able to make things work. Please also, as other speakers have said, consider outdoor cultivation on ag lands and indoor con cultivation and manufacturing in commercial and industrial lands within San Benito County. I'm asking specifically for consideration of the existing laws and anticipation of impending laws and activity at the ballot box as you have in your presentations from CSAC and RCRC and hopefully we'll continue with groups like our existing growers and manufacturers and leaders in public health, public safety, youth education and substance abuse prevention. I've had personal experience with veterans in our community struggling with PTSD. They've been able to utilize naturally derived medicine in the form of patches, tinctures, and edibles, enhancing their ability to sleep and in limiting their reliance on alcohol and Ambien. I also ask for your support of victims of traumatic injury and cancer to help them to alleviate their pain, regain appetite, and gain the healing sleep that they need to repair. These patients are not able to grow and process effectively at home and unfortunately have to travel outside or have a caregiver to get their medicines in San Jose, San Francisco, Santa Cruz, and in Delray Oaks. Um, we also, I'm also asking you to please consider both licensing and permitting fees as well as Prop 218 taxation, a minimum of 5% and as high as 10% with the June ballot supporting public safety education prevention programs such as Sun Street Centers who have been effective here. If you could summarize, Christina. Thank Absolutely. We haven't been able to compete for state or federal funds in the past, and I agree with Supervisor Botello that we do need to have our own fee structure. And we have likely enough data now from our existing legal operators to run our numbers and to see if it would pan out. With your continued leadership, we can make this work and get it done right to address our existing issues, examine and embrace a better future, including cannabis in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have questions of Christina? I, I, okay, I certainly do. Okay. Oh, sorry, Madam Chair, I have a lot of questions. That's, that's okay, though. That's what this is me meeting is about. <laughs> yes. Um, Christina, you, you advocated uh, kind of a, 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 a pretty or a field uh, type of uh, al allowance of cultivation mm -hmm. in different levels of zoning. And being a former planning commissioner, one of the things that concerned me was, you know, conflicts of one business entity having conflict with another business entity within the same zone in a, a allowable permitted use. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll give you an example. A few years back, you may even remember this. Uh, we 
had an application for a slaughterhouse. That seems pretty reasonable. Uh, we're an agricultural county, uh, heavy emphasis with uh, livestock. Uh, we should have a slaughterhouse. As it turned out, it was very difficult to, you know, have the, the appropriate conditions and zoning to place that slaughterhouse, and we, we ended up not having it. But um, do you see any conflict uh, taking the, such a broad approach that you're advocating mm -hmm. um, within, you know, having, with other businesses and, and zoning and, and, and so forth? I do see conflict, but I don't see that it couldn't be effectively mitigated if you put the onus on the applicant to prove that they've noticed residents, property owners, commercial businesses within a certain area to prove that they've had their consent and their approval to proceed with cultivation and manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a short, quick answer. Thank you. <laughs> no, you're welcome. Yeah. Any other questions for Christina? Not. Christina, thank you. Sure. Okay. You've got my number. Thank yes, you. Yes, we do. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? I was going to take a short break, but if we're not, if we don't have any other comments, then we, you, oh, come on up, and um, maybe we'll see how it goes after this speaker, whether we need to take a short break or not. Bill Bush. I want to say thanks for letting us come in tonight. I'm the other half of Sharon Bush that was up here recently. And I have to tell you, um, quick story. Uh, I've spent my entire life in, in aviation. I've been flying since I was 16. And I made it my career choice. And I presently own a business here in Hollister at the airport. Um, it wasn't, I developed diabetes and neuropathy. I can't feel my feet and uh, my legs at night. I, I'm the perfect guy here. I'm, I'm the end user. Uh, never ever did I indulge in drugs because of my rating, ratings in aviation and because <clears throat> the FAA frowns on it. And uh, I recently have relinquished my license because of my neuropathy for reasons that have to be apparent to, to the board here, you know. And I didn't feel that I should be taking anybody else's lives uh, in my own hands any further and fly people the way I have been all my life uh, with, with the way I felt. It, and I went forward, relinquished my ratings. I still own the business. I run it from the office now. I'm not a participant out there, which has been one of the hardest decisions I ever made in my life. Um, the only thing that I found that worked for me was cannabis. And it wasn't until just a few years ago that I was made aware of this. and. I was on gabapentin. I was. I'm on several, <laughs> several different pills. They all had side effects, and and uh, I found that by using cannabis as a medical alternative, I found that it's the only thing that's ever worked for me. Um, I prefer not to smoke at all during the day. I. I I use a vaporizer, a vapor pen, they call it, I guess. And I preferred not to ever use it during the day because of, of uh, just the way I am and, and my, my business. But at night, it's the only thing on the planet that I've used so far that keep, allows me to sleep, allows me not to kick holes through the, through the side of our bedroom. Um, because my feet are uncontrollable at night. So I'm the perfect person for all of this to talk to in terms of, I'm sorry about the time, but I That's think okay. you should, you I think you should realize this. Okay. It's people like me and people like cancer pa patients and people that 
you know, uh, have a dire need for some some type of relaxation. And <clears throat> had I not been twisted into this uh, by my son, to be honest with you, um, and made to try it, uh, I'd still be miserable. So I think it's important that everybody here realizes that I understand the money and I understand, I mean, I believe me, I, I'm, an, I'm a business, biz, uh, business owner here. I, I understand the taxes and paying all that stuff, but I, I can't comprehend and wrap my head around doctors that prescribe opiates and things like this that are almost impossible to come off and, in fact, not prescribe something like what my wife uses, which is nothing more than a spray in a CB, CBD, which has no head effect whatsoever, it's, but, it, but it stops her arthritis that she got two years after we got married, which is now 40 years. And <clears throat> so I've seen in a very short amount of time uh, just such a different way of living with her not hurting as bad as she does on a daily basis and certainly it's not going to correct my walking this is not going to correct any of that what it's done is it's helped me live further I mean because it gets pretty pretty bad when you go four nights without being able to sleep because your your legs are just charged with lightning bolts okay so I don't care what happens. I mean, I do for a lot of different reasons for these people, but I can tell you this. It's the only thing that's ever worked for me. I gave up, I spent a half a million dollars on my ratings. I'm rated as, as far into aviation as you can get without going into space. I've given that all up just to have some quality of life for the rest of what I have left. Thank you. So I just wanted to pass that on. I am the end user. Okay. okay. Thank you. Do we have any questions no. of um, Mr. Bush? No. Thank you, Mr. Bush. Okay. Any other speaker cards or anybody else that would like to address the board? Okay. Then I will just go ahead and close the public comments at this time and bring it back to the board. We have now the opportunity to either deliberate or, you know, discuss where we want to go with this, maybe set up another meeting, perhaps a workshop to, in a different format by the but committee. You, you tell me. Madam Chair, we, we heard testimony from the public. We have that input. What's the next step? Well, I believe that the next step, we do have a committee in place made up of Supervisor Patello and Supervisor Munzer, who is uh, testifying in Washington. That's why he's not here today. But um, they may ask for another meeting such as this one to give others an opportunity. You know, I believe that if you want to be successful with yeah. what you're trying to accomplish here, that one meeting may not do it. What, so. what, I, th I think the uh, committee and staff that's assembled here this evening would like to hear from our colleagues uh, on the board. We've heard from the public. But it, it, whether or not, you know, we should be pursuing within our ordinance, you know, just generalities. We're dig into the specifics and, um, you know, with our staff, what's going on statewide, what's going on within our region, as well as more input from, you know, some of the speakers. There were some good ideas that I heard tonight. And I really appreciate it uh, that taking the time to express that. But whether or not we should pursue um, residential cultivation, whether it, it, we should have it indoors, outdoors, both or not, um, commercial cultivation, uh, whether we should explore that to bring back and start developing that draft um, where when we get further along the process, get a draft have another public hearing so the public could review that mm -hmm. and take their input and, and then if we're ready um, that we could move it forward through you know the normal standard 
you know, adoption process, we'll go forward with it. If it needs more work, we'll work on it some more. But um, I don't want to, you know, spend a lot of staff time working on provisions for the ordinance just to have it shot down when we're ready to uh, move through the adoption process. So, you know, just maybe some general thoughts as far as um, some of the, the uh, what scope of the meeting uh, as far as, you know, limits of the uh, non-commercial and limits uh, for co commercial cultivation, uh, we would like to have some guidance on that. And limit uh, what um, cultivation? Commercial, you said commercial? Uh, commercial cultivation, if we're consider um, larger scale um, uh, cultivation, that's, you know, some of the speakers spoke about uh, this evening. Um, the non commercial is obviously the uh, patients that are growing it for their home use, uh, own use, uh, the card holders. And, um, you know, our first initial ordinance uh, restricted it uh, cultivation to strictly indoors. And um, are we going to continue that um, restriction or not? And also whether or not we should explore the commercial um, component. So any, any comments, any recommendations, any suggestions, uh, direction from the rest of the board? Uh, ma Madam Chair, um, I, I, I do like some of the comments that Chris, Chris, Christine said, Christine, I apologize, Christine said, um, I, I, I kind of feel that maybe the commercial component can actually can generate the most revenue. I kind of look at that that part. I, but also I think uh, one. Well, let me just uh, just to, to um, say that it doesn't appear that we can this this can be a money making a revenue making operation because we're and and council. I need to ask you this. It appears that the federal government is not going to allow us to make money off of any kind of operation, we can only recoup what our costs. Uh, is that, am I correct in that uh, at this point? Well, so when I hear the term commercial operation, what that means to me is that marijuana is being grown and then sold for profit, that, that they're selling it for money and they're making it a profit. My understanding of the law in the state of California and in the United States of America, the federal government, is that it is illegal to grow commercial marijuana and sell it for monetary profit. Under the Compassionate Use Act and under the uh, uh, medical marijuana le interpreting legislation, you can grow marijuana as a cooperative or collective for nonprofit, for not for money. You can cover your costs as long as the, the marijuana is being used by a, uh, an end provider that has the doctor referral and, and, and meets all the other requirements of the compassion use. If you do that, then you cannot be criminally prosecuted. Okay, so that's what's, for want of a better word, legal in the state of California at the moment. That still violates federal restrictions. But commercial growth of marijuana for profit is illegal both under the state of California and the federal government. Now, it may change someday with the initiative or referendum or the election, but right now it's illegal. Yeah. So, Supervisor De La Cruz, is that what you were referring to, that, that maybe that you were thinking that commercially the county could benefit Correct. by revenues? Correct. But it, it's not, my not understanding. Not from a profit component. Not from so yeah. the I will say to the board that the new legislation that's inter been introduced at the state of California does allow it does contain some tax provisions in there. Uh, it it says that the county can impose a tax on them. That raises a number of of interesting legal issues. Um, taxing what? taxing commercial growth, taxing the medical marijuana. And if the county does collect taxes, what is it supposed to do with the money? 
can it how is it supposed to be spent right now in, in Colorado and in Washington there's a major issues going on about with the banking system there because the f- the federally charted banks which are the majority of banks that are covered by the FDIC right. uh, are not accepting the tax de- uh, the deposits from marijuana from the taxes because they're afraid that the feds are going to come come down on them for that so that's why you see the state, the banks, and some other ideas along those lines. We have nothing like that set up in, in the county of San Benito. So where, what you're going to do with the money, where you're going to put it, and whether that's subject to federal seizure is, is, a, is an issue. Mr. Patelli, you still have the floor. I'm sorry that I interrupted you, no. but I wanted to get clarification on the federal side of it for money-making purposes. Right. I understand. And, and I don't know. Um, actually, the gentleman in the back, the one that – that we kept asking questions. Can you come up to the podium, please? Sure. Yes. I'd be glad to. It, like I said, it's complicated. Okay. Now, keep in mind that we have closed public comment now, so anybody yes. that comes up will be do, will be invited up by the board only. Right. Thank okay. you. So thank you. Thank you. Yes. My, my you were invited up, so you're welcome to, to answer any thank questions. Thank you. And um, about 10 years ago, I actually was a Ph.D. student at Santa Cruz, and I was doing financial surveillance, um, anti-money laundering for counter-terror financing, Patriot Act, FinCEN compliance. Ten years later, I never finished that Ph.D., but it's useful all over again because this is actually I've lobbied on on Capitol Hill with with, um, uh, Santa Cruz County operators um, and spoken with federal representatives, and they sort of tweak their head, and they say, whoa, you know what FinCEN is and you know what Treasury Department is? It's absolutely the case that banks are um, accepting federally chartered banks, let alone state chartered banks, let alone whether they have FDIC or NCOA or uh, other insurance, can absolutely accept um, uh, deposits. Now, whether they can run their um, operational revenues and their credit card transactions that's where the, you really need to get into more more um, specificity in terms of your relationship with your financial um, provider as a state lawful entity um, so um, banking there are plenty of solutions there's not enough solutions which is absolutely why um, uh, uh, assembly member wood and um, board of equalization member Fiona ma are, are suggesting a state bank and I and I have come up with some of the some of the language for the state bank um, uh, 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 proposals that are out there um, in terms of for-profit um, I believe the narrative is a little bit more complex than that um, there was nothing statutory in California um, that really really advance the notion that that nonprofit um, um, uh, uh, corporate entities were required. Nonprofit method of operation was stipulated in the 2008 Attorney General guidelines by then Attorney General um, Jerry Brown. In 2011, uh, Attorney General Kamala Harris was asked um, whether or not she would like to update the Attorney General guidelines. She deferred and said, no, I would like the legislature to provide guidance. The legislature just now has occupied the field and has absolutely determined this is the, the, the commercial framework for state compliant medical activity that we are implementing in consistence with the federal coal memo and um, the bill authors have in no uncertain terms stipulated that it was their intention to authorize for-profit method of operation for medical commercial cannabis activity here in California which is consistent with more states have for-profit than nonprofit. California is quirky in that we required nonprofit method of operation because we were the first. And so we were making it up as we went along. And actually, I see the benefit of, of being nonprofit. We, we provide um, a lot of the dispensaries operate community benefit programs, all kinds of great things. But um, it, is, it is an unwieldy um, uh, legal entity in terms of ownership and transferability and um, raising capital and equity and all kinds of more complicated things like that. But on those two specific things of, of, of for-profit versus non-profit, I would urge you, we are, we are deleting in Oakland the um, a, a 12-year-old requirement for non-profit. Um, most other um, uh, jurisdictions around the state right now that are adopting things are adopting something that will be future-proof. And I would say that, that you should just simply leave it as whatever method of, of, of organization that is uh, um, compliant with state law and not, not, not unduly burden um, at the local level because uh, then you'll got to go in and change it. So, I mean, on, on those two issues, banking, 
there are great solutions and and for profit is um, I understand absolutely authorized and if and if they didn't go far enough um, it's their intention the bill author's intention to clarify and to add further further guidance does that answer your question yes, madam chair okay, so thank you very much if uh, I could just do you have a question of this gentleman I, no, if I could say one thing pardon sure, if I could add yes, one thing please please so what the board should keep in mind when it's talking about commercial activities is even if the board accepts, and I think there's some truth into it, uh, given the new laws, that medical marijuana uh, can be grown at a profit. The problem that the county has if it allows large-scale commercial growth is that it has no easy way of distinguishing between that marijuana growing for medical purposes, which is for profit, and, the, and medical marijuana that's being grown commercially for residential. Um, I know that we're talking about a permit system, something along those lines, but the fact is is that uh, the people that are, not all the people are going to participate in the permit system. So um, it, it's, the board should, should think carefully about when it comes to large-scale commercial operations about what it's, it's actually getting into. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Are we good? Fair question. Fair, thank you. Yeah. I, I, but I think we can, work, we can work those things out. Yeah. Do you have a question as this gentleman? I didn't have a question as this gentleman. I just had, had a kind of a com comment on okay, as far as... Thank you so much. Course. Thank you. No, um, you know, I, I, I think the county council's uh, comments... Uh, for me, it's been pretty well received. I, I think the commercial component is a lot more complicated, and we could be jumping off a cliff if we're not careful. Um, I'm not saying that we should rule that out. Uh, there was the speaker from, I guess, the San Juan. They have a, a commercial operation. I kind of would like to see it uh, under some form of uh, regulation uh, and oversight on a local level to make sure that you know their um, operation is safe as well as you know the general area and and you know I went ruled um, something like that out and try to accommodate that uh, the point system as far as allowing a, a number of operators I, I Personally, and this is my as one supervisor. Um, I I don't want to see a whole uh, whole scale open wide open doors uh, for marijuana cultivation in, in the county. I think we need to have limits put in place at least to begin with. See how how things um, move forward. We have limited resources as far as uh, government services, public safety. Uh, we have to take that into account. It has to be uh, functionable for, you know, law enforcement. And it sounds like most of the organizations that spoke uh, today uh, support that uh, concept. And, and I think that would be the most prudent way to uh, move forward. The, you know, the initial question I had as far as the uh, re um, the, res the patient growing their own medical marijuana, uh, I, I think that could be done either indoors or outdoors as long as the outdoors uh, is somewhat discreet uh, and for their own protection and, and, and uh, you know, just, you know, for, for it to, to be uh, done correctly. So that's kind of what, what I'm looking at, but you know, of course I'm taking guidance from other board members yeah, too. Yeah, Supervisor Rivas? Yeah, I, I'm not a member of the committee, and um, I'm glad I'm not a member of the committee. <laughs> uh, you know, and I've said from the beginning that this is a very complicated issue. It's an evolving issue. You know, what happens if we create an ordinance and then recreational use is voted as law in California law next year? I mean, this thing is, you know, and, and, and I'm almost, you know, and that's why from the beginning I, I've, I've advocated that we carefully research this through a committee. Um, I think that we all uh, agree that this is the right approach, but I think there might come a time where we may just want to wait and see what happens. I and mean, we don't know what's going to happen. Things could be 
very different a year from now as far as what marijuana law is in California, even at the federal level. You know, I think that obviously the federal level, a lot has to happen in order to, for anything to change, especially when you talk about um, decriminalizing marijuana, you know. Um, uh, but, you know, this is, you know, I know the county of Monterey has put an um, interim ban. Um, they're in the process of creating a new ordinance. Um, we may want to see what they do. I know Santa Cruz, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I may be wrong. I just read about this. Uh, recently, but I think they're opting to do um, as far you know as far as from a commercial standpoint, just just going with a, a um, 100 square feet, you know, as, as far as you know the plants that can be cultivated. Um, but I think that we really, a small county such as our, uh, ourselves, you know, I don't want to um, limit the growth of marijuana in our county, but I certainly want to do it right. Um, and I think that maybe a waiting approach. You know, a wait and see approach is 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 the correct approach, but I really want to you know I really appreciate it. I learned a lot from a lot of the speakers tonight, and I think that this is like I said in, when we opened the hearing, this is the first step in a, a long process certainly, and I'm looking forward to see uh, what uh, kind of research and information we get from the committee moving forward. But this is not a not going to be an easy thing to 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 do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, Supervisor De La Cruz, did you? Uh, no, I'm okay. I'm okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Well, I there's so many. It is complicated, and when I see the presenters, the people that have come up, you know, locals. Only a third of the lo only a third of the speakers were local. The other two thirds were from out of town. What do they have to benefit for San Benito County to move in any direction? Unless there, I mean, I have to wonder about what the interest is uh, from the out of town folks and what they have to gain from whatever San Benito County does. I, w I really expected more uh, local input regarding this uh, issue. I thought that there would be a lot of locals interested one way or the other, but it doesn't appear that uh, we have that kind of turnout. I. I think the recommendation for criteria, I mean, is endless, endless. So I think I would like to go back to the original ordinance, but move into allowing outdoor with limits. I know that I was very um, set on just doing the indoor, but as I speak with people that do have to use it for medical reasons, it becomes a challenge for them to be able to grow it indoors. They may not have the right, you know, um, facility, the right size home, the right location, whatever. And maybe that's one place where I could be more flexible is to allow it to be grown outdoors for medical purposes. And do that now, and I think I agree with Supervisor Rivas and for anything else, wait and see where the state goes. And then we can expand that operation as time goes and we learn from the mistakes of others so any other comments from council and from our CAO so now what we need to do is to give well you heard my comments now so you right. can add that to your list um, so what would you like to do as a committee would you like to have another uh, meeting like this or would you like to invite people to contact you personally as you and Supervisor Munzer yeah, gathered I for Right. Uh, the wording together. I'm, uh, I am committed to do a, a little field trip next Friday with a individual to different facilities in, I think, in Monterey County. And and so we're continue to do that work. And, and I think we need to get together with our, our staff and review what we have. And... Um, and I want to invite anyone who wants to have some more input uh, directly with the committee and um, it, with specifics, you know, a little bit more details than what you could have the opportunity in three minutes. That's almost impossible. But um, I certainly uh, welcome all calls and all information and, and uh, uh, continue with this process. It's, it, it is complicated. It is hard, as Supervisor Revis uh, mentioned. I'm finding that 
to be a fact. And um, at a, some point in the near future, it'll probably be after our first uh, year, we'll have, uh, after we have a draft, uh, a little bit, something a little bit closer to a product, we should have another uh, hearing and input from the full board, and then we'll go from there. Yeah. That's and my suggestion on how to approach it. Yes, go ahead. This the subcommittee. Um, I hope that they have a, an opportunity to have um, have input from the public, and oh, yeah. and um, take the take take their views and take them into consideration and and um, get all that information, and then come back to the board. Um, because I mean, my understanding of the first time was more of a committee meet from the public and then go back to our chambers and and draft up the policy. So. I want to make sure the public ha is gives them is afforded the opportunity to to have input into it too. And I, I I have spoke to a number of people. We had the last speaker, you know, individual person that uh, it's helped, and I, I've visited with them. Uh, I've visited with people that uh, grow their own product, and and I I'm taking this really really serious. I'm gonna do the very best I can. I don't think I'll please everybody. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's no no getting around that. But, um, you know, I, I intend to do the work. Okay, and I think one of the things that we have to think about at this very moment is that are we talking about addressing what is currently the law into the state of California, which is the Compassionate Act, uh, and to allow uh, people to use it and grow it uh, for medical purposes? Or do we want to gear ourselves up for the recreational uh, use of marijuana is that we have to kind of weigh those two and see do we want to go there now or do we want to just address what's the current current law what I, I think the committee is trying to accomplish is compliance with uh, you know a state and federal law as it sits right as now it sits right now right my, my, my prefer is um, work with the what the state of California has given us and develop a policy that is evolving in case it does go into the recreational aspect. That's what I would like to see it, short term and long term. Okay. And uh, so, Supervisor Botello, if I understood you correctly, at the beginning of the year, you think that by that time you and Supervisor Munzer will have had an opportunity to maybe get some ideas back, put it in the form of a draft, perhaps have a have a regular board meeting, and where people can be. And have more input. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna give us a little bit more leeway than that. Let's okay. say February. February. Okay. No, that's good. You know, we need to, uh, because do, well, you know, the county no, basically shuts down in, in 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 a week or so, and you know, and people are more. I and we should be celebrating uh, the Christmas okay. season. Absolutely. So. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. So then, sometime in the at, at the the first quarter of the year, yes. then we should expect to have something that the public can either can come in and uh, have more input on what you came up with. Okay, very good. I'll, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So move, Madam Chair. All right. <laughs> Our meeting is now adjourned. Thank you everybody for joining us this evening.